Hello, everyone. It is very early on a Saturday, I agree. Uh, so we're here to uh, talk about development tools. Um, we did a bunch of this work actually inside Red Hat, um, as well as upstream in Fedora. And uh, you know, as you might expect, a lot of them are similar, but not always the same. Uh, so, but by way of introduction, I am uh, Langdon White, and this is Tomasz Tomacek. This is reasonably close. <laughs> Um, so I always like to do a, a little bit of an intro slide. Um, so these are my three kids, and as it says, it's the only way you can get them in a picture together is, you know, manufacturing it. Uh, so, you know, that's them. Uh, and then Tomas, you're going to introduce yourself, but I'm an architect uh, at uh, Red Hat. I work on platform, uh, and I've been the modularity objective lead for several years now. And go ahead. Yeah, so I'm Tomáš, uh, I like containers, sometimes they don't work, so it looks like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so right now we are um, trying to work on the development tools within Red, uh, Fed, Fedora and Red Hat. Yeah, sorry, I'm really sleepy. <laughs> and this is why we are doing this presentation today, that we would like to talk about it with you and maybe get some of the feedback and the discussion going. And I also like to point out, I have a cat, and this is what she normally does, uh, is just, you know, launches herself wherever. I have never had a cat that was so much like a dog as this one. It's quite amusing. Um, so I thought you needed a cat picture just on principle. So, uh, you know, kind of what, what are we doing here? Like, what, you know, this is not, you know, we could just come out here and talk to you, right, and make some stuff up. But so we want to tell you a little bit about why we have... Um, you know, we think some credibility on the subject, and basically uh, we did a bunch of work on this. So we had a uh, developer survey, and we've been doing one-on-one -on -one er interviews um, and anecdotal experience, of course. Uh, and so we're going to kind of present you the results of uh, the survey that Tomas run and, ran and uh, the interviews that... I've done a, a, like one of, but uh, we did a lot of work with uh, Mo Duffy, who's not here, but uh, she did a lot of the interview work, uh, and then we've done some results from that too. So if you want to talk about our survey? Yeah, so, uh, so if you are already part of Fedora community or working for Red Hat internally on our product, you know that like our developing tooling is like not very up to date with how it works usually on GitHub or in upstream communities. So that's why we realized that we probably need to do some survey, like ask the people who do the job every day and talk about it with them and get their data. And then finally, when we have all the list, what, like what really sucks, then we can prioritize it and start working on it. And this is what we'll be talking about today. So, uh, yeah, the only thing I wanted to point out was that my picture here for anecdotal evidence, you know, is the guy sticking his hand into a cactus. <laughs> That's what the picture is there. So I, I thought that was appropriate. Um, and so, yeah, so Tomas, you're going to tell us about uh, some, basically some of the highlights of the survey yeah. results. Yeah. So we were running the survey internally within Red Hat in autumn, and we got some pretty nice results. And I feel like that most of them are applicable in Fedora as well, because uh, actually Fedora and Red Hat like they share very, like very similar tooling. So if you are familiar with Fedora, there is Fed package for like interacting with the build system and with packaging, and we have very similar thing in, internally. And like all the shared code is open source, and there's just some slight difference internally. Uh, okay, so l let's get through like w what's not so good about our tooling. Uh, okay, so first thing, fixing upstream and backport to this git. Uh, yeah, this is a very common use case. So there's a new bug open for your component. Uh, there's already fixed upstream, or maybe there is not. So that's even better for the maintainer because you can do some coding. Uh, so the first thing to do is to uh, fix the bug, send the patch upstream, then uh, get a review, and once the patch is merged upstream, we can finally take it and backport it to our, uh, like either internally within Red Hat Enterprise Linux or in Fedora. Uh, but the backporting, like, if the code changed so much, like, the backporting is, like, ton of work. Like, you are probably familiar with that. And, like, can we do something about it? Can we make it easier? Uh, so I think we, there was already several attempts. So there's one project called Rebase Helper, which, like, tries to help maintainers with that. And I, I think it does, like, pretty good job. But 
a lot of people are not familiar with it. So definitely, if you're a Fedora packager, check out Rebase Helper. And next thing is rebasing patches. That's pretty much the like very similar thing when you are uh, when you have several downstream patches in Fedora or RHEL, and there's a new upstream release, and you want to like take that new release you need to rebase your patches. Like, ideally, yeah. drop them all when they were already merged upstream and they are part of the new release. But if they are not, you need to rebase them. And that can be really painful and really prone to errors because you see all the diffs and like, OK, so maybe this line is not so good. <laughs> At least that's actually my experience that when I'm rebasing my patches, like sometimes I, I, I forgot like just one line and then it makes it like completely useless. But that's when testing comes, right? Like, if you have really good tests, you can run your tests and see that uh, your rebase was bad and the software doesn't work at all. And, and, and really good tests are very common in software, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, upstream projects have really good tests, but we just need to like run them more often. Right, all right. <laughs> so going on to the next slide. Yeah. So does any, like, if you have any questions or comments, like, hey, you can use this tool to rebase your patches or to ease your Git workflow. Like, we definitely want to hear them. I actually brought a notebook to make all the notes. So please help us. <laughs> OK, so what's next? So next on the item from the results from the survey was kernel build time. I was actually checking it out yesterday, how long it takes to build kernel in Fedora, and it takes six hours. So imagine that you are like fixing something, you have a patch, you include it, you build it, and then in six hours you might get a result. So f for me, that's like really, like I, I wouldn't be able to work in, in such an environment. So can we actually like improve it? Maybe we can get some more beefy uh, computers and run the builds there, but that's also very expensive. So with like kernel build time, there's also like slow build time from other projects. So it's like the, we have also other component software which takes very long to build or even test. So for example, I know that systemd maintainers have tests for systemd which run for days, which is like, wow. But again, like, it's, like it's, very, it's really needed to have those, but when they run for days, we should probably figure out how to make them like more faster, maybe run them in parallel or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things that um, you're seeing a lot of organizations do, right, is uh, they actually do, uh, you know, different sets of the tests, right, uh, when you're doing development and, and compilation or whatever, um, so that you don't have to run the whole uh, battery of tests every time so that you can get your, your work cycle down faster. You know, one of the long mantras in programming is, you know, how fast can you make that, that write code, you know, test, debug, cycle, the shorter you can make that, right, the, the more effective you can be. And I think when we're, while we're introducing CI as the, through the CI objective, we really need to think about how, how we want to do that with, it's, it's kind of strategic, right? We can't, we can't just say, oh, it'll be fine if we just run all the tests all the time. We have to be a little bit more uh, particular about which things will run when, otherwise we'll just be waiting for builds all the time. <laughs> Anything else you wanted to say about this slide, or? Yeah, actually. So would I actually do, mo like on my own, when there, when there are slow builds or slow test runs, I usually like start working on something else. So then I worked on two things parallel, which like I feel like that is very productive for me because I, I don't have any downtime. But at the same time, if, you're, if you know Fernando Colione, who is an agile practitioner at Red Hat, like he's very, like he would tell me that like that's not a good idea. Like you should f like ter take only one task, focus on it, and do only one job. So, but if your job is to look at CI logs for 20 minutes, I'm not sure that's fun or useful. So I actually need to ask him about it. Like, wh what does he think about such situation? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know a programmer, I don't know about you guys, right? But, you know, I don't know a programmer who doesn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't kind of multitask in this way. And it does lead to problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you forget where you were or you forget w what's going on. And then sometimes it ends up being three different tasks or five different tasks because each one's taking so long. So we really need to figure out how we're gonna improve, you know, basically allow you as much as possible to be single focused or have mechanics around, um, you know, one of the big things that's bothered me for a long time, right, is like, how can we save our context, right? So, you know, is there a way that you can kind of keep the context from that particular issue while the kernel's building for six hours 
um, you know, while you work on something else so that you can jump right back into it because that context switching is what is really hard for a lot of programmers, uh, but for people in general, but I think it's particularly bad with programming because, you know, you'll have some random number or whatever that you have to keep in your head because it's the, you know, the, the input that you need to test, you know. So you have this weird context that changes all the time uh, that is very, very difficult to save off to the side. So, you know, I don't know about all of you, but like, you know, for me, like I end up taking lots of notes, you know, next to whatever bug I'm doing, um, you know, and then try to switch context and then come back, and it's not very efficient. Um, you know, so maybe some of the ways we can do it is actually help programmers uh, save their context, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I agree. That, that's what I also, like, learned to do was whenever I, when I'm working on something and I'm running, like, very specific long commands, I try to, like, include them in documentation, in comments, so that next time someone works on it, doesn't have to, like, reinvent it once again. Right. Invariably, I'll have typos in there and make it worse for the next person, but, you know, <laughs> that's just me. Well, learning experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, next. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, so what's next? Uh, ignoring broken content in Fedora. Yeah, so everyone who works on Red Hat Enterprise Linux know this very well. When, and this is actually like a big issue we are trying to solve right now, is that uh, we have Fedora Rawhide, so that's a place where all the new upstream content lands by default, but it's not gated, so for example, there's a new upstream release of curl, and we just put it to Fedora Rawhide, build it, and it's there. And maybe it would break rest of the operating system, and we would not be even able to compose it, or even use it, install it, update it, because of this change. But right now, we have no, no mechanic to do such thing. And if you imagine that like, this happens for like, tons of packages, and then we try to take them into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and they are like, coming broken so that a lot of people need to spend a lot of time on fixing them and then getting the changes back to Fedora. And so, yeah, so what we are trying to do right now is to gate on Rawhide. Like this will be our like objective like for the next couple of months, but I guess we'll discuss it later, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, getting broken content for, for Fedora. So this is like a real problem and finally to hopefully it'll be solved. Okay, so inconsistent results. So I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with such thing that you have a pull request, you are working on it, then you are done. It works locally just fine. You push the changes, CI and runs, and you get like completely weird errors, or maybe uh, there was a timeout on getting metadata for package manager or, or something like that, and you're like, okay, so that's absolutely not related to my changes. Okay, so retest. And maybe there'll be a different error. Okay, so let's try again and maybe third time is the charm and it suddenly works. So yeah, we need definitely to be better about this. So yeah, I just wanted to comment, you know, the pictures here, I'm sorry they're both, you know, covering your eyes, but I thought both of them were so cute that it was important to keep them. Um, so when I started actually working on the modularity project, uh, this and the build root management were both things that completely horrified me. Um, so, you know, that it is so common for packagers to just say, nope, just build it again, it'll probably work. And I was like, what? This, no, that's not right. Um, so that's one thing. And then the fact that build roots drift uh, really blew my mind um, and is, a, is kind of one of the drivers behind modularity is the fact that, you know, a build root is changing all the time underneath you is another thing that I find horrifying. Um, you know, and so, you know, there's been much discussion of things like reproducible builds and that kind of stuff. I don't even care about that. I just want things to stay still until I tell them to change, right? Um, and uh, so I think that's something else we need to really keep looking at. Uh, we've, we've started to fix some of that with modularity, um, but in my mind, at least, it's, it's not good enough um, because, you know, I, I want predictable results. Um, even if they're broken, I want them to break in the same way every time, you know? Uh, so I find this uh, particularly scary and something that we really need to be more consistent on, basically. Um, yep. Yeah, and this is especially problematic when you're, as you said, like the builder will change so often, like you're probably trying to build once again and then there are changes already which are like broken and you're trying to integrate to something which is already broken, so it's like impossible almost. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very impressed and equally horrified with the, uh, you know, how this works today. Um, but, yeah. So maybe to the third point, because it's actually not clear, I, I actually had to think about what I meant by this. So poor builder management, it's about Koji. So if you are familiar with Koji build system, uh, when you are submit a build, there's already a build route, which is a set of packages which are used. 
uh, for your build and you are able to actually change them like, okay, so I want to swap this one for a new version, I want to change this one, but it's like very manual, so you need to like a lot of typing and it could be actually more smart or more easy. And this is also something which we are working uh, or, or trying to figure out, but we'll talk about it later when we get to actually how do we solve all of these. Okay, so what's next on the menu? Chasing failures. Yeah, that, that's also actually pretty fun. Like when you, there's a new bug report and like you look at the report, it's like, okay, so I have no idea what's going on. And you spend days like trying to figure it out in your code or maybe figure out it's a dependency or it's a build system issue or maybe there's a CI environment is completely different and unstable. So chasing failures, yeah, it can take, I don't know, days, weeks. I heard stories about people who were maintaining some C packages and there were some memory corruption and they spent even weeks or months and in the end, uh, the fix was one-liner or something like that, so. I'm, I'm not sure how rewarding or actually fun this is. I actually never maintained any C package, so I didn't have pleasure. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So uh, it, this one I wanted to comment kind of on the pictures here as well because um, what I think par like what I think these all four of these kind of reflect is that there's not a very good pattern for um, you know how you kind of go through the process right um, everybody has kind of their own model um, and it's slightly different uh, and there's uh, there's not a lot of consistency there either and so as a result we don't have strong tooling to make the things that are automatable more automated um, you know and obviously there are some things that'll continue to be things that you have to do yourself right like chasing down a straight up bug it's just what you got to do um, and but when you when you have to think about how the branching works if you have to think about how bugzilla acts work or how you have to do you know whatever submitting koji builds and knowing what all the right flags are like all these things are are things that you have to keep in the forefront of your mind um, you know because you have to do them a lot but they're not you know it, they are documented, but they don't really need to be documented as much as they need to be, here's a tool that just steps you through the process, right? And says, this is the next thing you need to do. Um, and then you can actually, you know, kind of keep your mind spare, right, for, for actually chasing down legitimate bugs. Um, and I think this goes back to kind of the earlier point a little bit of, you know, the more inconsistency you have in your results, the more, uh, you know, what's more often introduced, right, is, is problems that you aren't aware of, right, or you can't, you, you know, you think there's a bug, but there isn't necessarily because it's just an inconsistent result. So those are, those are very hard on efficiency, right? It's like, you know, chasing down a bug is hard enough, but introducing a bunch of complexity to make it, you know, makes it much, much harder. And then if we go back to the even earlier point of kind of the context, if you can't keep that context, um, you know, it's, it, it just kind of keeps adding and adding and adding and making it more and more inefficient. So, so are you saying that we need some kind of developer dashboard? Like Perhaps a developer dashboard might, <laughs> might do the trick. Um, except, uh, so, you know, there is the existing developer dashboard. The, the challenge I have with that is that um, in some ways it's more like a portal, right? So it, it kind of gives you an insight into a bunch of different places in the developer kind of workflow or life or whatever, but it doesn't really, there's no real like kind of guidance around the actual workflow you have to pass through, right? There's no, um, you know, going, like I keep going back to context because it's a pet peeve of mine, but um, you know, there's no way to kind of say, okay, where was I on this issue I was working on? There's only, here's its current state, right? Which are not the same thing all the time. Okay, so to spend some more time on the other points, uh, so branching, so again, in Fedora, branching is actually fairly similar. Like in this git, you have one branch per uh, Fedora release. So it's like right now, there are three. It's Rawhide, Fedora 29, and Fedora 28. And like soonish, it will be Fedora 30 as well when we start working on it. Uh, but internally, we have like so many products. We have so many different releases, so many different supported releases. So for example, uh, when there is a bug or CV in, I don't know, like MariaDB, you need to fix it on 20 branches or something like that. And like you literally need to do like 20 commits in 20 different branches, which again, like why, is, why there is just not one? And well, maybe so this is, distribute it. This is a big thing that uh, was something we really have been working hard to try to fix with modularity 
is like, why is there a correlation between the database MySQL and the product it ships in, right? Whether that product, and I'm not supposed to say product, but whether that project be, uh, you know, a Fedora edition of 29, right, or RHEL, right? It's like, it's still MySQL, whatever, 10, right? You're like, why, do we, why is there any sort of connection between the version of the software and the thing it's going to land in when it ships, right? They're, like, at least at the Git level. You know, yes, somewhere along the way, there should be a config file that says, you know, yes, this, you know, MySQL 10 is in, you know, Fedora 29. Um, but why, why is that represented in Git in, at all? It just seems ludicrous to me, right? So um, I really hope that as part of the modularity work, you know, we've introduced... Um, and we don't really have good term for this, but we, we've been calling it arbitrary branching. But really, it just means branching that's related to the thing that is being branched rather than some random thing that's over here at the end of the pipeline. Um, and I think that really reduces the complexity of like having to keep track of where things go, but then also more so internally, where now maybe, God forbid, we could have, say, a branch for 10, you know, or maybe a branch for 10 and an LTS kind of branch for 10. But that's two, not 30. Right? Uh, so uh, again, we, we cross into pet peeves of mine quickly and I get, uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so, and finally we have two more things, which is bugs likes. Uh, again, like internally, we use uh, this system, like Bugzilla X, to actually, like, so, so when there is a new bug report, uh, you need to get like acknowledgements from, from the management that yeah, this is the bug we want to fix uh, and release. And you literally need to find the right people who are able to do it. And again, like it can take days because maybe the person is sleeping right now and you need to wait six hours to wait for him to get up and ask him like, hey, can you please tell me whether I should work on this? So again, we probably need some automation here to like make it much easier. And finally, manual steps. Like again, if you're a Fedora packager, you know that there's a ton of manual steps to when there's a new upstream version, you need to like pull the tarball, then commit to this git, then build it, then wait for the build, then produce an update, and do the same thing maybe for Fedora 29 and 28. So again, it takes 30 minutes when like the manual step should be like, yeah, I approve this change and that's all I'm doing and everything else is automated. So. Next slide? Y yes, please. <laughs> it's, it's snowing. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I checked before I came and it assured me in the, on the interwebs that there would be no snow this week. Um, so that's nice. Um, I apologize for the lack of pictures on this slide. I ran out of time with, uh, with funny pictures for you. Um, but uh, so some of this work is still going on. So we've done uh, a fair number of interviews uh, with, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one with developers, um, trying to keep it open-ended, kind of uh, trying to keep, um, you know, using kind of formal interviewing processes. So not so trying not to, you know, lead the, the person we're talking to. Um, and so some of these are some of the highlights of things that uh, we discovered uh, were kind of. Um, well, let me, let me back up for a second. So one of the biggest things I think we discovered, it wasn't really that much of a surprise, but it was interesting at how pronounced it was, is that all the different kind of, you know, subcategories of, you know, Fedora do work differently, right? So, you know, the desktop, you know, team does stuff one way, the, um, you know, the, the Python team does stuff a different way, um, and in, like, every regard. Like the and on top of that, they mostly have had the same process for like many years. So they're very, very used to it. Um, they are absolutely certain that their way is the best way compared to all other teams. Um, however, they also all recognize that there's inefficiencies or problems with their, their way of doing things. Um, so I think that was kind of the most pronounced component. And so introducing change into that process for any team is very, very difficult, right? It's, it's hard to change your muscle memory. So that's the first problem I think we have to get over. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> uh, the other thing we need to uh, deal with is that uh, those teams have different processes often for good reason, right? Um, and so we need to, uh, somebody had a great phrase with this before, but it's like, you know, but now I can't think of it. But uh, basically we wanna have, um, you know, the same outcomes, but we don't necessarily have to have the same process to get there. But we need to recognize that different teams will have different processes, <coughs> excuse me, and maybe need to use some of the same tools. Um, excuse me. 
I'm not sure what's up with these water bottles. Um, so, but a couple other highlights that we pulled out was um, that a lot of developers are, uh, you know, as part of that, you know, different processes, a team may be sharing uh, some, like, hardware components and, and using them together. But more often, every individual developer, <coughs> oh my goodness, um, is doing things their own way with their own technology. Uh, and so that can be, uh, you know, it, it's expensive in the sense that um, they have to do a lot of work to maintain that hardware or that software or that build environment or whatever it is that they happen to have. Either, even if they're doing it as a team, when you know, most of the teams are not you know, 100 people, right? Their teams are five. So that means that you, you're putting material uh, energy into maintaining that environment, even at the team level, that you know, could be much more of a shared kind of infrastructure component. So that's, uh, that was one of the big draw-ups that we came from. Um, and then the next one is, uh, oh, I actually mentioned this already, but the lack of consistency uh, between tools and teams. Um, and then the protocols and procedures. Um, so not only do they do kind of different things technically, but then they also do different things uh, kind of organizationally as well, right? So like how they do code reviews, say, or how they do uh, that kind of work uh, where, you know, some of them do it more so or less so, and they have different processes for these. So we need to make sure we recognize that uh, teams will be different, um, but how do we get the same output uh, by, uh, but still allowing them to be different? Um, uh, another big thing is that uh, we're starting to see, you know, people starting to using containers, um, and, but that's a very limited amount, uh, and I think that was one of the takeaways was like, if we could uh, help uh, build out uh, kind of the uh, build and test infrastructure using containers that the uh, benefits of using a container to do that stuff is so high that we might get large adoption from the different teams which might change their processes without you know us having to introduce the change which everyone's going to be annoyed by and not do right so uh, that's kind of an opportunity for us to be able to introduce a change that makes more consistency, you know, and more shared resources without having to fight through, uh, you know, change control, right? Um, so, and the reason I said so, we've we've done all the interviews. We're not uh, completely finished with what we think is the like the write up or the output. So that's why I'm kind of drawing out some highlights. Um, but we should be having some proposals. We're going to talk about this in a bit. But some proposals going forward um, of like kind of specific projects that we'd like to take on. Uh, to, uh, to make some of these problems go away, hopefully. So, now the good news. Um, let's see, oh, I'm first, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, there's a number, okay, so just as a little bit of background, uh, Fedora Objectives is the idea of, uh, in the Fedora Council, um, we dis decided, uh, this was a few years ago now, but that we weren't getting enough things where uh, we wanted to move Fedora, the project, kind of as a whole towards a particular goal. Um, and because Fedora, right, in a lot of ways, doesn't produce anything, right? It, it takes upstream components and then makes them work together, which is huge, right, and a lot of work. But, uh, you know, actually having Fedora, you know, actually drive project is one of the things we wanted to kind of change. And so one of the first ones was the modularity objective, right, is that there's no upstream for that. It doesn't make sense as an upstream, right? It's part of the distro about how things come together and how they work together. And so what we wanted to have is kind of a vehicle for that kind of work inside Fedora, which we've never really had very well before. It occurred, but it wasn't really formalized or, or discussed in, uh, per se. So we introduced this concept of the objective. They're supposed to be, uh, I want to say, um, you know, nine to 12 months. Um, and then if they, if they need to continue, they get renewed. So you write a new objective, and then it gets renewed. Um, so very recently, um, like within the last, I want to say, six months, there was a new objective introduced by uh, Paul Frields uh, for, called the life cycle objective, which is like how can we... Um, improve uh, the kind of life cycle of the Fedora releases themselves um, because we weren't, no one's really looked at, you know, how do we at least consider like something like an LTS release. Um, not necessarily that it's a good idea, but what is it about that that might be interesting uh, and what, do we, what would we need to change if we wanted to go to a, you know, two-year Fedora or what would we need to change if we want to go to a two-week Fedora? 
Um, and so that objective is about improving our technology and processes and stuff like that. So we can make either one of those true, and we can make either one of those true depending on addition, right? So the addition could actually decide that they want to do, you know, much faster releases, like something like the Fedora Core OS, or much longer releases, uh, you know, which is being considered by the Fedora Workstation team. Um, so that's the lifecycle objective. Modularity objective, I obviously brought up a, bent, a bunch, uh, which is the idea of how can we um, have applications have a separate lifecycle uh, from the operating system itself. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're trying to do there. Um, so that's the modularity objective. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys know what that is mostly already. Um, the Decade project is the one that I'm kind of leading internally that was doing the interviewing, uh, as well as trying to make some spot fixes here and there uh, for uh, kind of the developer experience uh, when building RHEL primarily. Uh, we're looking to try to figure out how we make sure all that stuff goes upstream as well. Um, but that's where some of the things that we've been looking at so far are mostly around where the differences are in the process between Fedora and Red Hat. Um, but we're hopefully you will be doing more of that soon. And then you want to talk about the other ones? Yeah, sure. So maybe just for you to understand the little thing just happened. So there's no clock. So I can't see what the time it is. And it's really frustrating. And the only thing is that that thing showed me, but it blanks after 10 minutes. So it's like, what time is this? Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so we have more objectives. Uh, uh, so we already spoke about like packaging and how actually updating is really frustrating because it's so manual and CI and those stuff. So right now there is new objective. So actually the name is Packager Experience Objective Proposal. It's not like packaging objective. Uh, and it's submitted by a community member, Ben Roser. Uh, and it, this is a very nice write-up of things we should work on in Fedora to make like packaging much easier. So it's really about like improving the tools, improving the processes, and like this this really could be the thing which makes it much easier to like live as a packager in Fedora. Uh, then we have CI objective. This is led by Dominic Perpet. So there's like so this was already done uh, and it's like finished. But like, right now we are working on like a next version of CI objective v2, uh, and it will be posted I, I guess within a couple of weeks and. Within the CI objective, one of the goals is to gate rawhide. So seriously, build the gate and like put police officer in there. And if there is an update coming which breaks breaks the distribution, we just don't allow it, and we wait for the packager to fix it, or maybe or actually fix uh, uh, wait for the upstream project to fix it uh, before it lands in Fedora. And this will like greatly improve Fedora rawhide and make make it stable finally. And uh, the last point is, so if you were actually yesterday at our presentation with Steph, we were talking uh, about very similar topics as we are discussing today, and we'll be working on an automation service for packaging. We call it Packet right now. Uh, so please watch the recording from yesterday. Th the thing is that, yeah, we just really need to get rid of all the manual steps and bring upstream and downstream communities together. Because right now, we as a federal distribution, we don't contribute, like, we don't provide feedback back to upstream. So when there's a new version of, I don't know, some Python library, we don't tell the upstream developers, hey, your newest release doesn't work with uh, our distribution right now, or it breaks these components, or here's the test failures, please fix it, or tell us how we should fix it. Uh, right now, we are doing a very poor job, and within the package service, we are trying to address it. So maybe the, when there's a failure, we send an email to upstream mailing list and tell them, hey, your component failed testing in Fedora. Maybe this, this is interest to you, or maybe not, and we won't do it ever again. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so I just want to add a little bit more, which is just that um, even though I have it written as packaging objective here, it's actually, it's still a proposal. It's not actually officially an objective yet. Um, and then I would just also want to mention that packet and source gate are the, the projects you're working on related to this, so they're the name of the projects. Uh, they're, you know, I would say mostly tied under the CI objective, um, but they're, they're more cross-cutting than that. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, um, it, they've been doing some great work about kind of automatically pulling upstream code um, and making it land in Fedora uh, without as much human intervention, uh, which is really nice. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> right. Um, all right, so next slide. 
um, and this is where we, uh, we start talking to you guys, um, you know, is, you know, what do you guys have for ideas? Uh, we really like feedback, um, you know, comments, what, what things bother you, um, what things, uh, you know, are you trying to fix, what things do you have that you use that, you know, everybody else should be using too. Um, and I know it's very early on a Saturday morning, so, but nonetheless, I'm hoping you guys will have some ideas. Anyone? Bueller? Steph? <laughs> <laughs> I know some people in the audience. All right. Well, this might get very short, very fast. Right, so I'm going to repeat the comment. I'm going to repeat the comment for the for the mic. Right, so um, basically the, the comment is, um, you know, if we want to try to get our branching down to uh, you know by uh, kind of application level, right, um, we might end up with challenges because there's different spec files depending on uh, the release that that package is going out in, right, um, and. If, or we can you know, kind of merge all that into one spec file and we have lots of conditionals in there which can be really messy. And um, I would comment back that, you know, uh, a, okay, yes, you are correct, right, 100%. Um, however, uh, is there not ways that we could automate um, the changes between the spec files? Is there not ways that the only thing different between those is literally the spec file? Um, so part of the challenge, at least for me, I think is, uh, I think that is part of it is that we use tarballs, right, rather than actually using the source trees. Um, so I think that uh, that introduces more complexity uh, to how you do the branching. So yes, I agree. It's it's not an open and shut case, um, but I think there's ways we could do it better uh, and still reduce the number of branches and also not clutter up spec files, right? Um, I don't know. Do you want to add? So to be honest, I actually disagree. So okay. I understand your comment that when you have, for example, two, okay, we have two branches, like Fedora and CentOS branch, and we would have like two spec files, and if like each of the spec files would be like very tied to the specific release, uh, you would need to, like right now you are maintaining two spec files, not just one, so you can't put it in upstream or anywhere else, there are just two. So whenever you, there's a new update, you specifically need to like make the changes to one and to the other one. But if you have only one spec file with all the ifs and elses uh, and like that, you are maintaining only just one. So you can easily tinker it and it's just one. And yeah, so this is like really problematic. So maybe we can change spec files and improve it or maybe we can template it and have like a template somewhere and you just run the templating engine and it, it will spit out the CentOS spec file and it will spit, uh, spit out the federal spec file. Maybe that could be a solution. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, maybe I didn't explain it very well. But so I guess the, the, the kind of spec file improvement side of it, right? Are there, are there ways that we can, you know, either automate the generation of them to begin with, um, you know, or whatever, like this, this seems like a really, uh, like simple problem that causes a lot of work, right? Um, is, I don't know, I guess my general opinion. I think Steph may have a comment. Well, why don't we start with removing the chain box, removing the revision, such as removing the horrible things that get in the way of any modern tool working on the spec box. So the comment is basically, um, you know, one of the one of the things that's part of why spec files seem to change so much is the change log. Uh, Steph and others find that uh, not particularly valuable anyway, so why don't we just dump it, um, which uh, I think is a, kind of a funny recurring theme. Um, so yes, but I don't think it, it really goes to the real problem. Um, you know, like as in, we, I think we kind of need more like a templating engine kind of model of some kind, uh, uh, you know, one of which might be simpler because you got rid of the changelog. Um, I don't know, comments? So, so we actually already have there. We already have a bunch of tools which generate spec files, namely for each of the like language ecosystems. And you just, okay, here's the upstream project, and it generates the spec file, which is like very good, precise, 
And like we probably don't even need spec files. We can generate them like right. up front. We can just all go to Anaconda, or to whatever that one's called. Um, but uh, yeah, so there and there. Yeah, so basically, I think the point being is that we actually do have a lot of this automation that we just don't use consistently, um, or it's overly specific to you know a particular ecosystem. Um, and so that's something we should be really evaluating uh, and you know encouraging into our our tool chain as a way to do things better. Right. Right. So the comment is that you know there's other RPM distros like SUSE who have made improvements along these lines that we could probably adopt um, and uh, you know maybe get away from our fascination with uh, spec files being such a hand built uh, piece of perfection um, that they really don't need to be. Uh, more comments? Slavic. Can I take it? Yep. Okay, so. Don't forget to repeat it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Slavic's comment is about uh, build routes, like the place where you are doing builds in, inside the build system, and that it takes a lot of time to set it up, like because Koji needs to prepare all the repositories, and yeah, it just takes time, especially for all the architectures. And Slavic's comment is about uh, that we should cache them, and that should speed up the build process a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. We actually discussed this on Monday with Fedora Engineering. Uh, when we are talking about uh, like getting raw height, uh, so uh, there are actually a couple of things. So I'm not really an engineer. I have no idea how Koji works. I only know like only some of the things. Uh, but the comment from Mikola Izdebski was that you can actually like there's al there's already a solution in place right now that you don't need to regenerate build routes that you can actually like reference different build route and it won't be regenerated. So it would be actually loaded from cache. So that would actually literally work as Slavic suggesting. As far as I know, this is what modularity is doing. Like they are, you are not regenerating builders, you are using those from cache. Right. So we already have solution in place, we just don't use it, which is like mind blowing. Yeah, I, I, and also personally for me is like, if, if it was more of a policy that we used, um, you know, cache build routes or whatever. I think we also get back to the my you know the other thing that I bothers me is the consistency of the build route, right? Um, is that you know if you can kind of control the drift of the build routes, I think that's also very useful. Um, but you know, there's a side benefit of it also being much faster. But then you also get this um, the fact that now you actually know what's changing, uh, which I, it, that just like I said scares me. So, All right. so, so actually, maybe another comment. Uh, because we actually didn't discuss this. So, okay, so imagine scenario that you are updating uh, like NCARSIS in raw height, which means that you, you like bring the new update and then you need to rebuild all of the packages which use the library because they would be broken otherwise. Because like also as presented, there's also a name bump. And you like, you can't do it in raw height because like when you land the change, you break everything and everyone is really angry. So you need to do it like like on the side. 
So you create a new Koji tag, and this is your place of work. So first you update NCARSIS, and then you start rebuilding all the packages uh, <laughs> until like everything works, and then you take, take your work and merge it back into the, like, into the main line. And again, like, this, this was one of the comments from, from the survey, that this is very manual, like lots of typing, prone to error, and like takes a long time. And this is again another thing we'd like to solve uh, by like introducing a new like like a new way to do it very easily, so that you very easily create new tag, uh, put your builds you want in there. You are doing all the builds against it, and then there would be a step where you say, okay, right now we are going to like run the CI and see if all the new builds work, and if everything's working, we can uh, merge it back. Uh, and everything is nice. Uh, and I remember this was the comment about like when we when we would actually implement this, uh, like we would be using those cached build routes. So yeah, so this was the comment. So I wanted to move on just a little bit, um, which is here are some of the questions that we had um, that uh, we would like feedback on, uh, and you know, and anything else obviously that we've been talking about. Um, but we're we're running out of time, so we wanted to kind of say here's some other ideas, some things that we've thought about. Uh, we really like feedback from all of you about things that you've been thinking about or things that annoy you, uh, so that we can try to help address them going forward, um, you know, and actually add them into you know whatever the objective work and stuff. Um, so the last thing we wanted to cover is basically like how do we how do we make this you know how do we get this out to people right so how do we tell people what we've done what we're changing what we'd like to change you know what what would work you know does anybody have any ideas about how you know we could kind of do this as a community more um, you know one of the ideas I've had for a long time is if um, if something like the FPC was less of a, you know, kind of a board and more like a working group, so like a place where you kind of go and talk about, you know, packaging and like what problems you're having, um, you know, maybe it's not literally the same group, but, you know, kind of like would it help be helpful if there was a place where uh, people would go and um, talk about improvements to things like packaging? Um, you know, or where, where would you discover ideas about like how you could improve your own processes? Um, and that's kind of what I was hoping to ask you, and maybe do you guys have any ideas around that? Um, I, I, I'm reacting to what you had on the first slide about the displays. Um, and I was wondering if there would be a way, you mentioned that, that there are tools from the spec files and so on. There are now those GitLab files, almost, you know, in many, many projects you have those, uh, uh, the, the, the various YML files that describe how to build this project. Would there be a way to exploit these existing files that are already there and build some tooling that basically helps us build this other uh, from source distro aspect? Is this something that makes sense? Yes, absolutely. So that's why how all the generator spec files tool works. So for example, pip2rpm uh, takes setup.py, finds all the dependencies, and generates the spec file ba based on it uh, so that all the dependencies are right. So this is how the tools work. So the problem is that you have like special snowflakes, like very nicely crafted, which... Can you, can you run the menu? Uh, yes, the you generation run. tools? Yeah. yeah. So, so what I'm talking about is having something that scans the projects we have, look for, okay, this one has a setup, so yeah, this one has a why and so on. And then I use that, and I build the spec file from that, and see where this goes, whether this actually works. Does that make sense? Yeah, so he's essentially, I think you're saying it's like, um, as part, almost like part of our CI infrastructure, for lack of a better term, um, you know, can we actually run the generator, like actually walk the projects, looking for things that look like the things that we have generators for, generate them, build them, and then propose them as uh, changes back to the developer, um, you know, based on however they were generated. I don't know, I think it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Like we can, uh, and we could even cover like, I don't know, like 80% maybe of the mm -hmm. distro. Like there still be like a lot of special packages which need like very, very nice care. But like for basic Python or I don't know, Node.js libraries, we can do it very easily. This is also one of those places where, um, you know, you ever heard the, you know, perfect is the enemy of the good, right? Um, like if we knocked out 40% of the packaging work, that would be ridiculous. 
ridiculously a lot of time, right? Like we don't have to get to 95% for it to be useful, you know? Well, then if you think it's a good idea, can we stop later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we are out of time per the red sign I just got. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, hopefully it was useful.